Hey, good morning. Good to see everyone. Woo! Last week, my daughter got married. Yeah! Woo! Somehow, I'm not sure it's going to be cheaper, but uh, there's always hope, you know what I'm saying? Uh, she married an incredibly great guy. She didn't live with us for the last nine months, but he did. And so I had a dude in the room next door and being able to bond with that guy, enjoy that guy, he's now going into ministry, he's just, and so being able to see my daughter smile and laugh, their uh, number one thing that my girls want, I only have girls that, one number one thing they wanted uh, during the wedding time was for me to be on the dance floor. And uh, I'm just gonna tell you right now, that is a poor choice. <laughs> That is, uh, I'm 6'3", I'm really white, and uh, it's very awkward, but anyway, uh, you do a lot of stuff for your kids that you wouldn't normally do, right? And, and I, I would just say that knowing that I get a chance to have my daughter transition into a relationship that I know is healthy, that's an incredible feeling. It's an incredible feeling to celebrate all of it and be able to go, what a wonderful, wonderful day, you know? You're cleaning up and picking up stuff at 12.30 in the morning, and you know, there's a lot of work in all that stuff. So it was such a joy to be able to know I was doing it for the best reason ever, and it was a smaller wedding. It was 95 degrees, it was outside, and uh, so that was a little, a little warm there, but other than that, it was an absolutely perfect wedding, and it was so fun to be with my kiddos and my family. And so thank you so much for once again having that opportunity to you know, step out to do these, these different things. I'm locked in for the, today and then the next three weeks. And if you have ever wanted to invite somebody and you go, every time I invite somebody, that stupid guy's not preaching. Um, I'm gonna be in for the next three weeks. Uh, you can uh, invite friends and family. We're just gonna be talking about Jesus, talking about freedom, talking about life and salvation and eternity and joy and laughter. We're gonna have a fun time doing it. If you've ever had anybody that you care about in your life, you'd love to invite them to church. I would encourage you. Let's do this. In the next couple of weeks, let's grab that. I understand a lot of us have different vacations. Uh, as a matter of fact, my kiddos just sent me a happy Father's Day text with them on the sands of Jamaica. And so I deleted it. <laughs> the heck, what is wrong with you, right? You know, and uh, anyway, uh, how about we start this off right? Grab your Bible, let's take out the handout sheet given to you at the front door. Let's do this. We are in part 13 of a series walking through the Gospel of Mark that we entitled The Greatest Opportunity. If you're brand new with us, we've been walking through this whole year trying to say that I think God has opportunities surrounding us 24 hours a day. We're just not seeing them all. And what we're trying to do is open up our eyes and figure out how do we see the divine appointments? How do we see the ways that God has set things up for us to walk in partnership with him? I think that's a way more fascinating Christianity. And so the best way to do that is to look at his life, look at how Jesus did things. You realize he just seamlessly and beautifully walked through life where even though things didn't go easy for him, it seemed like he was always in the right place at the right time. How do we live a life like that? So we're gonna talk about that, but I wanna fill, fill, draw your attention to the fill in the blank. Um, and I wanna talk uh, about this concept of why we do what we do. Uh, why are we acting the way we're acting? Why do we live the lives that we live? I think it'd be nice if we could all say, you know what, I, I'm a Christian and I do Christian stuff because I'm really in love with Jesus. Uh, every day I think about my devotion to him and my identity in the Lord and I, and I make the choices I make. But I'm, unfortunately, I'm not sure that's true. I think for a lot of us, we're on autopilot. You know what I'm saying? Like, think about it with me this way. Wouldn't you agree that even without any ministry stuff, there's plenty to do during a day that can take up your time? You know what I mean? Like you do to-dos, Right? You get up in the morning and you're like, man, I got a lot of to-dos. I got stuff I got to get done here. I got to go to school, got to go to work. I got to handle the kids, got to, whatever it is. Whatever you got, your whole day's packed and you didn't do any intentional ministry whatsoever. And I'm afraid if we continue on that groove, if we continue on autopilot, autopilot tends to go very self-focused. 
Autopilot tends to build your kingdom, worried about your retirement, worried about your family, worried about your home, worried about your business. And I feel like if we continue to just go on autopilot, we're gonna die with regret. Man, did I do anything with my life? Did I, because all that stuff, if we only focus on today, if we only focus on the temporal, if we only focus on the earthly, it's always going to disappoint. It's not good enough. But if we focus on the things of God, if we focus on the things of kingdom building and not just our own building, now granted, you gotta take care of your family, you gotta do jobs, you gotta do these things, they're not bad. They just can't be your everything. And I feel like there's a huge difference between living with the perspective that the world centers around you and living with the perspective that the world centers around God. I feel like we live different. Our motivation for why we do what we do curtails and focuses our vision for why we live the lives that we live. I think there's a massive difference between someone that lives out their identity in Christ as already loved and someone that lives out an identity of performance to get love. Big difference there. I think there's a massive difference between those of us that live strategically to build the kingdom of God and those of us that merely live sin management. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before. I heard it a number of years ago, I think from John Ortberg. Never forgot it. Sin management, that's what so many of our lives are for those of us that are Christians. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to be more moral than we were yesterday. That we're, we're trying to make sure that we can contain the flesh. And a victory of a day is we didn't do something terrible. And I'm just telling you, that is not a motivating way to wake up. That's not gonna bring you fire. You know what I'm saying? You don't get up and go, well, just don't blow it today. Like, that's such a drag. That is not worth getting up for. Might as well go back to bed. But if you can get up and say, what's my divine appointment today? What is the miracle I'm gonna walk into today? What is the partnership with God? I have no idea what he has in store, but I'm gonna accidentally see it around me and I'm gonna walk into it. Maybe I could pray for somebody. Maybe I can care about somebody. Maybe I can see a miracle today. That's something worth getting fired up for. That's worth getting up and getting out and doing stuff, yeah? I mean, that's the Christianity that we ought to be living, and that's not going to happen as long as it's all about us. The fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you or on the app, if you're following along, is God's kingdom is top priority. God's kingdom is top priority. And when we get that laser focus, wow, it changes stuff. Last week, can we have an appreciation for Pastor Jenny that preached to us? Come on now. <clears throat> Now, now, Pastor Jenny, uh, she was one of the leaders, teachers, um, and I don't have very many of these where I actually didn't know her personally, right? So she's filling in the pulpit. I got a chance to Zoom with her. Uh, she lives out in D.C., and we got a chance to talk a little bit about the message, and she had come with very, very strong recommendations, and she has a very unique gift mix. So she can come in with humor, then slice and dice scripture backward and forward, and then drop it very personal and raw. You know what I mean? Like that's such an unusual gifting. And, and so I was super excited for her to come out. And so I told her on the Zoom, I said, hey, Pastor Jenny, you know, you can, you can do this just as a theologian. You can teach it as a pastor. You can teach it any way you want. But I, I just want to encourage you. I think we have an opportunity here. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're going to teach two critical stories. The story of a woman that was hemorrhaging blood for 12 years and the raising of a dead young girl, I said, as a woman, you're going to interact with this story and see something instinctively that I will never see. I said, I can do all the study in the world, I'm not gonna know certain things. You're going to know it. And I said, so if I could encourage you on anything, would you please allow the Holy Spirit to breathe a freshness through you as a woman? to bring in something fresh for us that the guys can't bring to the table. And this is the reason why I'm so vicious about wanting diversity of voices. Is I, I can't just have it be me 
talking out here because I need Pastor Judah to come in and talk different than me. I need Pastor Brian to talk different than Pastor Judah. I need Pastor Rodney to talk different than Pastor Brian. I need Pastor Heather to talk different than Pastor Rodney. And it goes on and on. Why? Because our God is so beautiful and creative and brilliant, but he's multifaceted. And unless we get more of the Holy Spirit spinning through different conduits, it's not good enough for me. I want more of the revelation of God. I want him to reveal himself in fresh new ways to us. And I get it. It's sometimes it's fun to kind of have a, a comfort zone where we're hearing a voice. But you have to remember, I'm also going to church here. I also live, have to hear these messages. I'm also living under these messages. And I just know I need diversity of who the Holy Spirit can speak through. It's not the person, it's, it's God, amen? And so I get super excited when we have visitors. So what uh, Pastor Jenny did is she closed out a three-parter that the gospel author Mark set up, and it was Jesus is greater. He's greater than nature. And I told the story of calming the wind and the waves. Jesus is greater than the demons. And I told the story of that man that had a legion of demons and he was healed instantly. I t and then she told the story of Jesus is greater than death by raising that young girl to life. This was Mark's way of doing a trilogy. Jesus is greater than all things, both natural and supernatural. We are now going to pivot in the gospel of Mark to talk about Jesus was extremely popular at this time. In northern Israel, he was the man. He could do crazy miracles. He said stuff nobody else said. He healed stuff nobody else ever imagined. And as a matter of fact, I mean, it was, Luke adds this phrase. He said, and Jesus was being glorified by all. Now, that's a rare thing because we all think about his rejection later on. But man, he was rolling strong. Things were going amazing. Yes, the religious leaders had problems with him. But if we're talking about the public, he was super popular until he went home. And we're about to read the story of what happens when he went home and how different it really was in Nazareth than it was anywhere else. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter 6? Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. If you need a Bible, there should be one under the seat in front of you. It'll be page 841, 841. If you brought your Bible from home and you're not familiar with it, just drop it open in the middle. Go really far to the right. You're going to hit Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are the Gospels. We're going to hit the second one. That's Mark. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to talk a little bit, read a little bit. Talk a little bit. Here we go. Mark chapter 6. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown that we know as Nazareth. And his disciples followed him as their rabbi. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? The son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us. And they took offense at him. All right, now if we just read Mark, Mark is the brevity guy. He's like action gospel guy, like get in, get out. Tell me the story, just the basics, move on. That's why I always tell people, if you want to start with any book of the Bible, you usually want to start with the gospel of Mark. He will tell you very rapidly the ministry of Jesus. He doesn't slow it down like Matthew does to talk about the teaching details. He doesn't talk about the history like Luke does. He just gets in, gets out. The problem with that is the way he just said that, it just seems like a wah, wah. And it actually is really dramatic. But we have to go to Matthew and Luke for that. Because what it sounds like is Jesus comes into his hometown and everybody's like, yeah, this guy's awesome. And then somebody's like, yeah, but I went to middle school with him. And they're like, oh, you can't be the Messiah. Does that make sense? And then everyone was like, I don't think he's the guy. And then Jesus kind of couldn't do a whole lot of stuff. That is true, but there's so much more. So let's talk about what Luke shares with us. He said, actually, 
everything kind of got bad because Jesus went to church. He walks into the synagogue, and the way that their synagogue worked is that you would go up and you would read a passage of scripture or make a comment to it, and then you would sit down and everybody would talk amongst themselves, gather their questions, and you would start a dialogue debate. It was very interactive. So Jesus, they're like, hey, rabbi. He's like, yeah. They're like, you want to speak? And he's like, sure. And they said, what scroll can we get you? Now, they did not have one Bible book. You have to remember, they only had the Old Testament because they're writing and living the New Testament. They only had the Old Testament. It wasn't one book. It's a whole bunch of books. So what they did is they had a bunch of scrolls of whatever pieces they had. And he's like, hey, I want this scroll of Isaiah. And they're like, you bet. And they hand it to him. He rolls it out and he reads a very famous prophecy about the Messiah. And here's what he read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Now Isaiah wasn't necessarily talking about himself. He was talking about a future figure and what it means to be anointed by the Holy Spirit of God meant, and all the Jews knew, the Holy Spirit did not just come on everybody. He only came on certain people for certain reasons. Prophets, priests, kings, very key. So whoever Isaiah was talking about was a very key figure, and God's anointing would allow him to do the impossible. Everyone's like, I love this story. I know this one. Man, this is one of my favorite parts. I got it underlined, right? And Jesus is reading it, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I love this one. It says, and I was called to proclaim good news to the poor. They were like, ooh, that's a good one. Because most leaders don't minister to the poor, but the Messiah was going to. Let me tell you how to run a successful church, right? Here's how it kind of works. If you want to have a successful, now I'm going to use that in quotes because I believe success for a believer is obedience, nothing more. That is the only definition of success. But anyway, let's play games like everybody else does. That there's this other idea of success in the world's eyes, and it means that you have a really big church and everything's great. If you want to do that, there's a very simple way to do it. What you got to do is you got to go into a new area that you don't know very well, but you set up in a wealthy part of it. That's your job. Find the wealthy people, connect with them, because they will fund whatever you need to do. If you minister to poor people, they don't kick back. And then there's a variety of things that you can do, and you can have success. Now, what's intriguing, now some people are actually called to that, that's their assignment in their ministry. There is no negativity on that. But if we're simply trying to do it like the world, it looks quite a bit different than how Jesus did it. Jesus actually came in and he started hanging with people that didn't bring a lot to the table. So I don't know if you remember an old book that was called Jesus in the Margins. And what it was talking about is it was highlighting how often he would hang with a tax collector or like a leper or like a woman with bleeding. Like they didn't give him anything. He gave all in those scenarios. Why did he do that? And he said, I did not come to what? Be served, but to serve. So you saw him operating with the poor, the oppressed, the downcast, the outcast, because he was a different kind of king. So this prophecy was saying, the Messiah will come and lead a movement with not the wealthy leaders, but the every people. He said, and God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Captive, oh, they're like, oh man, I hate Rome. He's like, dude, we're not being political. I'm talking about you're captive to your sin, you're captive to the devil, and I'm here to get you out. He has sent me to recover the sight to the blind. Do you think that's only physical or do you think that's spiritually blind? He has sent me to set at liberty those who are oppressed. What were they oppressed by? Oddly enough, religion. Do you remember Jesus had a very famous phrase? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What was he talking about? 
He wasn't saying, come to me and I will make your life cake. He had a very difficult life. What was he saying? I'm not the heavy, weight on your shoulders religious guy. As a matter of fact, I think we've made it way too complicated. He said, if you really want to boil it down, here's what it boils down to, everybody. One command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, if you do that, there's no way you're not going to love your neighbor as yourself. Upon this hangs the law and the prophets. Every single thing I've ever chased you about was relationship with God, love connection, and caring about other people. Because if we have that fire, if we have that focus, everything else actually will start to bend in. Our job is not to sin manage and try to be moral. If you spend your life trying to remove stuff out of your life, you're going to find that it's going to pull in something nastier. Right? Oh, dude, I got off heroin, then I took up cigarettes. Oh, I got off cigarettes, I took up drinking. Oh, I took... That's how the human being works. We have a craving. The way Christianity says it is shove in great stuff so that the other stuff is in the way and you have to vomit it out. That's what it says. It's like somebody that has a hard time quitting smoking, but then they want to take up marathon running. You know what I'm talking about? Now all of a sudden they're fire for marathon running. They're like, I noticed I need to breathe. And they're like, wow, this cigarette is really, <laughs> right? The whole time you're jogging and it's like, boo, 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 boo. It, that, you realize, well, this is ruining my lung capacity. And so now it's in the way. Your passion for something greater has made that something to be discarded as opposed to I'm gonna sit in my room every day and try not to smoke a cigarette. Man, that is just recipe for disaster because we have a void. So Jesus comes in and he starts saying, listen, there's something different in town. I am here, he reads, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It is Messiah time. And everyone was like, yeah, love that. Good job. Woo, preach it. (laughs) And then he does this cool move. He's handing the scroll back and he says this line, quote, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. T-kunk, drops the scroll, and he sits down. Everyone's like, oh, did you hear it? He just called himself the Messiah. Whoa, right? And everybody's freaking out. And they're all talking amongst themselves. And they're trying to process what this would mean. And at first, everything is going Awesome. Now, check this out. I I love this. It says in Luke, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. Like everyone was like, love, this is incredible. Wow. And then they start asking questions. And the first question was, where did this guy get these gems? Like he's talking like he's been to heaven. He's talking like God's his close friend. Like I've never heard anybody talk like this. And where, the second question, where to get power? I mean, this guy can heal, this guy can cast demons in a way that nobody has seen. So I don't know if his power is from the devil, I don't know if his power is from God, but you cannot deny this guy is Lumen large. Those were all beautiful questions. So I want to talk about questions for a second, because I think there are good questions and there are bad questions. I think there are healthy questions. There are unhealthy questions. You're like, I thought every, no, there were no bad questions. Oh, there are. <laughs> Let's talk about healthy, good questions. Healthy, good questions are any time you're looking for truth. If you really want to learn, then there's no bad questions. And you go, well, why would you ask a question if you don't want to learn? That's the whole point of asking a question. Oh, I agree with you. As a matter of fact, if you're new to Christianity, or maybe if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, here's my encouragement to you. I do not know how you can own your faith if you don't tear it apart. I don't understand how you can walk in confidence, especially certain personalities. I don't know how you can walk in confidence if you haven't asked the difficult questions, because somebody's going to ask you, right? So I tell you, bring it. You're not going to break Christianity. It's been existing for 2,000 years. It's dealt with all kinds of people. You're not going to ruin it. Ask what you need 
to ask. Because if you don't ask those questions, life is gonna crash the question into you and you're gonna spin. So ask what you need to ask. Why does God allow suffering? Ask it. Why did God let your child die? Ask it. What the heck is going on with hell for eternity? Ask it. Ask the questions you need to ask. Because if you're seeking truth, God gives you massive leeway to work stuff out. The book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Psalms, the book of, right? Job. You got somebody processing, even in an aggressive way, but their craving is to know. And God says, you know what, kiddo? Bring it. You need to know what you can know. There's some stuff you can't know, and you have to be okay with that. But you're allowed to ask the question. But then there are questions that are not good because they're not actually questions. They're manipulation. Give you an example. Anybody remember the scene in the Garden of Eden? You have a serpent that comes up to Eve. What's the way he started that conversation? Did God really say? He asked a question. But what was his point? He knew the answer. He wasn't asking to learn. He was asking to sow seeds of doubt. That's called manipulation. Have you ever been around somebody that offended you and they go, I'm just asking. You're like, dude, no, you're being a jerk. You're not just asking. That's not right. Like, you don't want to know the truth. You're just trying to aggravate something. You're trying to say something in your question. Those are not healthy questions. Those are not good questions. And quite frankly, a lot of the questions we ask God are not to learn, but to shut God up. God, why would you do this? Can't believe you're doing this. I'm not gonna worship a God that does that. You're not asking questions. You're making statements. And you're not gonna get very far. And you go, well, how do I know if I'm processing emotional pain or I'm processing unhealthy questions that are manipulative? There's actually a very simple way to ask that, to answer that for yourself. It's one self-diagnostic question. Here, you ready? Who do I think I am? Ask that question, you'll get on the right path. Because if you are somebody that is lacking and you need, you're probably gonna be on the right path. If you're the superior to God and he needs to answer to you, you're way out of line. Because if you think you're God's superior, you're gonna be resisted the entire time. So yes, how we ask questions matters. So notice the first couple people are like, dude, I don't understand this guy, valid. The other person's like, I don't know if this guy's legit, valid. But the next questions that come out, and I don't know who said it, but it changed the atmosphere of the room. And here was the question. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Does that sound like an actual question to you? Or are they trying to make a point? They know he's a carpenter. Everybody knows he was a carpenter. Now, let's talk about that for a second real quick. And this is a little side note for Bible nerds. A lot of people are like, well, you know, it says in one gospel he's the son of a carpenter, and the other one says that he's a carpenter. <gasps> is it a contradiction? Okay, no, that's ridiculous. If you're an apprentice to your dad, and he does it, and then you do it, you're both carpenters, great. And then the extra Bible nerd is like, you know it doesn't exactly say carpenter. Okay, you're absolutely right. The word says artistic craftsman builder. So whatever they, he did with artistic craftsman building, did he work with rock? Oh, he was a mason. And you're like, okay, so, well, I don't know, maybe. It could be metal. It could be wood. It doesn't matter. And you're like, yeah, but if he was a carpenter, how weird is this? He worked with wood and died on wood. What? Okay. <laughs> Now, here's the funny thing. It may not mean wood. And then you're like, I already put the bumper sticker on my car. My boss is a Jewish carpenter. Do I have to change that? And I was like, well, technically, you should have said, my boss is an artistic craftsman builder. That's what you probably should have put on there, but you committed. I get it. We all make mistakes. 
But they're asking, and here's their whole point. You're blue collar, dude. You do what we do. You're not fancy. Like if you're a fisherman, you're a builder, whatever, man, you're not a big deal. Aren't you the son of Mary? Now, looking 2,000 years later, we're like, yeah, he is. Virgin birth, what's up? Right, okay. (laughs) That's not what they meant. That was an insult. You never refer to a man in public as the son of his mom. Doesn't matter if she's a widow. Notice Joseph isn't mentioned anywhere. Joseph hasn't been mentioned since Jesus was younger. So he probably died earlier in Jesus's life. We know they had more kids. They had at least six kids after that. So he was alive for a little while, but he's gone now. But even if she's a widow, you never dishonor a man in public by referring to his mother. You were supposed to say, isn't that the son of Joseph? Why would they say it? Where is he at? Nazareth. What's his hometown? Nazareth. They all remember the scandal. And they're pointing it back out. Dude, you're illegitimate, bro. Your mom got pregnant. They weren't even married. We all knew that. And I'm going to tell you right now, no illegitimate kid is going to be the Messiah. So I know exactly who your mom is. I actually know your brothers. I know your sisters. They all live here. You're not the Messiah. And just like that, (laughs) the faith goes right out of the room. Whatever vibe was going, that doubt, that attack changed everybody's mindset. And now all of a sudden it turned aggressive. And you're like, well, it doesn't really say that. Hold on, hold on. It actually does say that. But let's handle the fact about his family. A couple of things that are interesting to me. Now, I honor and respect Mary, right? She's a better person than I'll ever be. Jesus, God chose her because she's rad, okay? I'm just gonna question her choices. After you have the Messiah as your firstborn, why would you have six more kids? The, what a downer. Like every one of them's a disappointment. Like, you're like, oh, this baby's awesome. This baby's amazing. And then you had another one. You're like, oh, it's broken. (laughs) Then you have another one. It's broken. Do you not see the pattern? Your children are all losers. You had the Messiah. The rest can't match up, all right? And so the whole thing is the rest of their lives, you're not like your older brother. You're not like your older. How irritating is that? And then they go, mom, you act like Jesus is perfect. And Jesus winks. (laughs) I am, whatever. Anyway, and then we got to talk about these guys, right? So there's four brothers. And do we know anything about them? Well, we know uh, something about two of them. We don't know anything about the other two. So let's go through them. First one is listed James. James we know the most about. Okay? Remember, at this time in Jesus' life, no one believes in him, in his family. He has no believers in his family. As a matter of fact, we just studied a story where his family went to go forcibly remove him from the ministry because they believed he was out of his mind. So they're not buying any of it, all unsaved. But James got saved. As a matter of fact, he became what the Bible says, the pillar of the church. He took over the Jerusalem church. He was the bishop. He was known as James the Just. He wrote the book of James. That's pretty incredible. And you go, well, how did he get saved? Well, it really helps when your brother comes back from the dead. (laughs) Hey, James. (laughs) He's like, I just need to hear the words. Just say it. You were right. (laughs) That's what I thought. Right? So he got saved. And then it goes down to the next guy, Joseph, which is just a stupid name. It actually should be Joseph, and they just decided to nickname it lame. The next one is Judas, right? Do we know anything about that brother? We do. He had a nickname. What was his nickname? Jude. He wrote the book of Jude. There you go. So he too got saved was a big part of the church. And we don't know if the other brothers got saved or not. We gotta assume that they did, but the last one was Simon. Then it says he had sisters. They are not named. 
History tradition, which is super sketchy, suggests the names of his sisters were Salome and Mary. Now, this brings up a pet peeve of mine. I hate all their names, and here's why. Do you know the names of the disciples? Do you know the names of, here's what it sounds like. Hey, I brought my friends home for dinner. Hey, Simon, I'd like you to meet Simon. Judas, meet Judas. Simon, meet another Simon. Oh, great, James, I'd like you to meet, that's right, James. Okay, Mary, I need you to sit next to Mary, 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 and Mary. <laughs> the heck? Name someone Charles. <laughs> this is just dumb. Like, you can't, like, why can't we just have a little creativity in here? But anyway, so really, it would be Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, Mary the friend or aunt. We have Mary the mother of Jesus and her daughter Mary. <laughs> Seriously, you guys? Okay, anyway. It says, and they took offense at him. Now, we're going to talk about how offensive it actually was, but I want to highlight one piece. There is a sense in which their familiarity did not allow them to receive from him. And we're gonna talk about the danger of that in a moment, but I wanna ask you a question. Have you ever believed that you knew theology well enough, or you knew God well enough that you walk into church and you can't learn from the pastor? Because you know better. That's a problem. We do not walk into church and go, I just wanna be in a church where the pastor agrees with me. No, and here's the interesting thing about it. If you come into church and you're like, well, I, I just disagree. Do you really believe that we gather together and you're only gonna hear Lance's opinion? Do you know how much of a drag that is? I'm not that good. I better just be a conduit for God and share God's word, not my opinion, if we're ever gonna change. Is that true? So when you walk into a church, you're not just hearing from a man or a woman, you're hearing from God. Now, whether or not they're a messed up conduit and they screw it up, that's on them. But know this, even if a young child shares with you truth, it's still truth. I'm just saying, let's be very careful that we don't shut down hearing revelation because we don't like the conduit. Right? We'll get into that a little bit more because it gets very dangerous. So here's what happens. It says, and Jesus said to them, a very common teaching of the day, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, once again, Mark cleaned that up. Sure sounds very basic. Jesus is like, hey, when I get really familiar with you, you don't want to receive me, and then it kind of shut down his ministry there. That's actually not how it went. How do we know that? Because two other guys wrote about this. Luke said a couple things that are really, really important. First thing he said, quote, and Jesus said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. But I tell you truly, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Now, what does that mean? It says, and he could not do many miracles there. And we tend to read it in Mark as if they were assessing him and then he couldn't do many miracles there. That's actually incorrect, it's backwards. My suggestion to you is that he had not been able to do miracles there because of their lack of faith and they were challenging him on it. That's why he brought up the quote. He said, obviously you guys are miffed about the idea that I Move my home base from Nazareth to Capernaum and everywhere else I'm rolling strong in miracles, but I'm not doing it at home. And you guys are saying, well, that's because we know you better. We know you're bogus. You may be able to snow everybody else, but you can't do it at home. We know you backward and forward. They were filling in that gap with questions about his nature and he spins it around on them and goes, I'll tell you exactly why I don't do miracles here because of your hard hearts. And you were like, oh, that's not gonna go well, right? 
And certainly, it does not go well because Jesus doubles down and pokes the bear. He said, while we're talking about it, (laughs) and you're like, oh, shoot, here we go. While we're talking about it, anybody remember Elijah the prophet? They're like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Elijah's my favorite guy. He was a huge Jewish hero. The guy's like, oh, yeah, I have this poster on my wall. (laughs) He said, you remember three of his most famous miracles? Shut off the rain, healed Naaman the Syrian from leprosy, and raised the kid from the dead. Anybody remember those? They're like, dude, don't insult us. We know Elijah. He goes, do you remember the fact that they were all Gentiles and weren't Jews? They're like, yeah, that's one of the greatest embarrassments of our history. He goes, do you remember why he couldn't work with the Jews? Because of their hard hearts. Oh, guess what you're doing right now? He's picking a fight with them because he just brought up an embarrassing story, shoved it in their face, and said, you're the exact same type of people. And they lost their minds. They were so extremely angry. And I'm gonna tell you how bad it got, but I wanna wanna talk about this idea of no prophet is acceptable in his own hometown, the danger of familiarity. The danger of familiarity is that it lowers your faith. Now remember, faith matters. Faith is believing Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. Faith is not the Star Wars force. Faith is belief in a person, right? But how you believe God can move will change the outcome. What do I mean? Hmm. It says, and Jesus could not do many miracles there because of their lack of belief. What does that mean? Did Jesus not be Jesus? No. The Holy Spirit, remember, Jesus limited himself, and he only did what the Father said and only did what the Holy Spirit empowered him to do. The Holy Spirit (laughs) turned off the power, powered him down. And Jesus was like, I pray and nothing. I pray in nothing. Why? Because if a miracle is done in a lack of faith and there's not going to be faith, it's simply a healing for temporary, no purpose, and it takes away the consequence of sin. It ruins the plans of God. So God will not, unless he has a way to use it for good, he's not going to waste miracles. He shut it off, and Jesus was powered down. And he's like, listen, I'm normally rolling with power, but when I get around you guys, you ruin it. So the Holy Spirit shut it down. Jesus could not do miracles at will. And that's very important for us to understand. There's a lot of people that don't believe the miracles are for today. And they'll say silly things like, well, if you really had the gift of healing, you'd empty the hospitals. What a ridiculous thing to say. Why? Because even if you have the gift, even if miracles are for today, you're still not in charge. So let's go through this for a second. I've prayed for people and they've been radically healed. Now I've been prayed for 90% more people and they weren't radically healed. But I've prayed for people and they've been radically healed. Quick question for you. Who did it, me or God? You sure? All right, when I pray for people, who gets to dictate whether or not they get healed, me or God? God. You sure? Because if that is true, then why are we so hard on the conduit? What if a six-year-old child wants to pray for you? If they're a conduit and the source is always God, you let the six-year-old child pray for you and they'll probably rock your world. Because it's not the kid. It's not the conduit. It's not the person. And here's where this is going to bite us. If we're too familiar with somebody, we don't believe God can use them. And we will pull back our faith and shut things down. And the Holy Spirit will not move. How would that work? It looks something like this. Imagine I told you, hey, you guys, in three weeks, there's this national guy, and he's going to come on in. He's got this crazy killer anointed ministry. He heals people in a way that most people can never be healed. This is incredible. The Holy Spirit uses him really good. And you're like, oh, man, I've been dealing with a chronic issue. It's about time. You wait for that. 200 people line up. You're going to wait six hours for that dude, because you go, finally. All right? Now, put a pin in that one. 
Let's use another scenario. I say, prayer team, come on up here at the end of service. You have a chronic issue. And you go, you know what? I'm gonna try to go out on a limb. I'm gonna go up for prayer for my issue. But the whole prayer team is full except for your neighbor, Rick. <laughs> who you have a problem with a shared fence. <laughs> and you're like, oh, heck no. If that dude can't even figure out property lines, he certainly can't do the supernatural. And so you don't wanna to go to Rick. What's the problem with that scenario? You keep thinking it's Rick. It's never been about Rick. The source is God or it's not at all. So we must be very careful when we start estimating who can and can't do things. Is it God or is it not? It says here, it says, um, and Jesus was restricted, and we, I just told you it got pretty violent, right? How do I know that? Listen to Luke. When they heard what he said to them, and when they poked the bear, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him off the cliff but he passed through their midst and went away. Okay, that's how bad this church service went. They were so mad. Like, praise the Lord, that hasn't happened to me yet. I keep trying, I keep poking. But so far, everyone's like, where's the cliff? It helps to live in like a flat land. Anyway, it's not important. He didn't just leave Nazareth because they were like, meh, meh. This was violent opposition. And he was like, that's what I thought. And he moved on. And he went about among the villages teaching, verse six, and he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Hmm, well, that's interesting. Kind of a weird assignment. This was their next step in an apprenticeship. They had observed him probably for a year and a half, maybe two years, and Jesus said, it's your turn. I'm not gonna be with you. You've seen me cast, you've seen me heal, you've seen me preach. You know what you're doing, you go out and do it. I'll follow behind you, we're gonna debrief at the end, but I'm not gonna be with you, kids. It's your turn to go. But Mark, again, simplifies it. Here's actually how Matthew said it. And Jesus gave them power and authority over all demons. What does all mean in Greek? All, very good. <laughs> and he gave them a power to cure and heal every disease and every affliction. That's a lot, right? As a matter of fact, here's how he summarized. And Jesus said to them, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. And wherever you go, proclaim, God's in town. That was their job. But what was so interesting about it is he gives them all these restrictions about how they can do it. He's like, travel light. And they're like, well, how light are you talking about? No, I'm talking about bare bones. You don't get to bring a begging money bag. A begging money bag is where you'd actually have it out in front of you, almost like a street people where you would go, um, like a street performer, you would have your money out there. That's a begging bag. You're not allowed to bring one. As a matter of fact, you're not even allowed to bring an extra tunic. What would you bring an extra tunic for? Because at night, it doubles as a blankie. You have your jacket on, and if it's cold, you wrap the other one around you and you fall asleep. He said, don't sleep in the streets. You need to do your job well enough so you get into somebody's house. This is our task. As a matter of fact, I don't want you bringing any bread. They're like, well, if I don't have any bread, I'm gonna die. He's like, well, then I better, you better get some on the way, huh? You better work there. Because here's the deal, and Matthew says it, a laborer is worth his wage. What does that mean? Don't work, don't eat. He's pushing these guys out into a vicious training session. They have to walk into a town and figure out if anybody's going to help them out. Here's how the Bible says it. And Jesus said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from it. What does that mean? If you walk into a house and they have a lame bed, you don't get to hop houses. Go where I tell you, deal with what I give you. 
If any place, any town will not receive you, they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Matthew adds, for truly I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than that town. Dude, that's hardcore. This is a very different perspective of ministry. Notice there's no begging people to be Christians. There's no shoving anything down anybody's throat. You're presenting good news. Hey, Jesus loves you. And, oh, hey, Christian. All righty. Bye-bye. You go to, <laughs> knock, knock, knock. <laughs> right, you're on the next door. Because the idea was, I'm not going to beg you to be a Christian. Do you want to live? Great. There's only way, one way to do that. That's Jesus. You want to know more? I'm right here. But I'm not here to beg you. I'm not here to plead with you. Either you want it or you don't, that's it. And you know what? If you're gonna all lock up against me, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'll just hand you over to Jesus. He knows what to do with you because I'm not playing games here. And Jesus was like, I got your back, guys. We're all one unit. Shake off the dust off your sandals. That means I hand you over for judgment and I want you to move on. But if you're out there, do the work because rejection is part of ministry doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means it's hard. Nobody coasts through ministry. Ministry is brutal. Is it valuable? Yes. If you have a grace for it, it's the greatest job you could ever have. If you don't have a grace for it and God has called you to do something else and do ministry on the side, you need to do that. But here's the whole point. Jesus said, listen, guys, you're walking out in a very tough environment. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. I want you to be as wise as serpents, as innocent as doves. Guys, use your head. Go out there. They're going to hand you over. They're going to arrest you. They're going to do all kinds of stuff, but don't you ever worry. Holy Spirit's got you. Whenever you need to say anything, the Holy Spirit will take care of you. I've never left you alone, and I never will. Do not be scared. Do not be shy. Do what I've asked you to do, and I will back you up. Wow. Verse 12, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent or change their minds, and they cast out many demons, anointed with oil many who were sick, and healed them. Why is it important that they did miracles? Two things. Number one is because people needed real help. I think we forget that we are the ambassadors of heaven. They're supposed to get help from us. Number two, I think people need to know we're not just talkers. I think they need to know there's something legit. I think they need to know that there's power from heaven flowing because then they're not just believing in a theory, they're believing in a person. And that makes all the difference in the world. What an act of Christianity. Can you imagine getting up in the morning for that? Hey man, what'd you do? I cast out three demons today, what'd you do? The other person's like, dude, I watched the guy's limb grow. It was awesome. They're like, that never happened. No, seriously, it did. Seriously, it did. It was a, it was a little limb. It's not important. It's not important. A limb grew. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Our lives cannot be as simple as it's about me getting by. That's not fire. It's got to be I live every day with a ready yes on my lips for my Lord, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to change the world. That's worth getting up for. Can I have the prayer team come on up here? We're going to close out. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we love you, and we thank you. Holy Spirit, there is nothing done of great value without you. You are that beautiful fabric of reality that makes things deep and right and good. So right now, we just pray that you would anoint each and every one of us that can hear this, that you would anoint us that as we walk out today, we would have our heads held high, we would go out with purpose and intention and strategy, that we would go out and love on people and help people and care for people just like you did, Jesus. 
And Jesus, would you allow us to make you famous, that your name would be praised, not ours, that your kingdom would be built, not ours, and Lord, that you would be pleased with this generation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend.